Did you hear what you were singing? God is always on time. He knows where you live. He has your telephone number. He's got your address. Did you hear it? Why don't you stand up one more time? Just one time, if you will. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to give us open ears to hear what He wants to say. <clears throat> we pray that for every service among ourselves, but let's do it publicly this morning. These are very difficult times, and <clears throat> I, I would not believe, I know for myself and for every one of the pastors here and those that we invite as guest speakers, never approach this pulpit without having been with God and pleading for a word from the Lord to lift up the church, to correct the church, to do what God says so that we can be built up in the faith. And I'm praying now that God would speak through my lips and sanctify the lips and uh, just let this come forth. I, <clears throat> I'm not going to shout at you this morning. I'm not capable of that much anymore. But you'll hear the voice of the Lord. You'll hear something from God's heart. And let's pray for open ears. And we can mix the word that we hear with faith. Mix it with faith. I have no rebuke. I have no bad news. This is good news from the Holy Spirit. And <clears throat> He will speak if we open our ears. Lord, we pray for open ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. Lord, I don't have anything to say worthwhile. I have only the Word anointed by the Holy Spirit. It can't be just a dead letter. It can't be a sermon. Lord, this is not the time. Not anymore. This can't ever be the answer. There has to be something from your throne room. And I'm asking you, Lord, to take over and possess my body, my mind, my spirit, that I may speak as an oracle of God, not of man, that you would open up our ears, get our eyes off of the economy, get our eyes off of all the fearful things happening in the world today, and refocus on you and understand the majesty and the glory and the power of our God who's at work even now. We will hear your word. Pray it with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to give me an ear to hear what the Spirit says. Amen. And be seated, please. Thank you. I want to speak to you about what it means to live by one's faith. What it means to live by one's faith. Habakkuk. Now, that, if, if you want to find this wonderful little four-chapter book and Bible, just look to Zephaniah. And if you can't find, go to Nahum. And it's not but a few books over from Micah. I'm not being facetious. Some of us have a hard time finding this. I'm going to wait for a moment just until you find it. And go to chapter 2, if you will, please. This is Habakkuk speaking. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and I'll watch to see what he's going to say to me. He's, he's waiting alone. He shut himself in with God. And I, I, I will find out what he's saying to me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and plan it, make it plain upon tables that he that may run, that, that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it's going to speak. It will not be a lie. Though I, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now here's my text, verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up in him is not upright, but the just shall live by what? No. 
You skipped a word. He shall live by what? The just shall live by his faith. Now, this is the first time this phrase is used in the Bible. The very first time. Paul the Apostle uh, quoted him in three times in Galatians, I believe in Ephesians. It's one of the most preached texts in all the Bible. The just shall live by faith or by his faith. Paul made it a foundational truth for the doctrine of justification, uh, sanctification, the purifying of the heart by the Holy Spirit, literally salvation itself by faith, the just shall live by faith. You receive joy by faith. Everything is received by faith. This is where I'm going in my message today. He... he had a dreadful vision. This prophet had a dreadful vision of a great calamity that was coming to the land and surrounding nations. And the Lord said, you write it down. You may not understand it right now, but write it down. <clears throat> what I tell you is going to be fulfilled. And he said, if I, I told you how severe it's going to be and how tragic it could be, you would not believe it. I will not tell you that. But I am going to tell you, this man, if you look at the beginning of this book, Habakkuk, it says the burden of the prophet, the burden. He was a burdened man because of the grief he carried over the despising of God's word in his time. The law, he said, was not just. The, the rulers, the judges were ruling in favor of those who were wicked. The laws of God were totally despised. There was violence. There was fraud. The rich were taking advantage of the poor and stealing their houses. And there was grief over the flaunting of the sins. In, in, in the original, it says in one of these descriptions in the first chapter, you, you, you have described uh, the grief. And his, what he had been seeing in the spirit and God says I'm going to bring against this nation an enemy that is going to be my rod why here, here is the prophets cry before the Lord even told him what was going to come and in Malachi or Habakkuk 1 3 and 4 the prophet says, why do you show me these iniquities? And why do you cause me to behold grievances for spoiling in original perversions and violence that I have seen before me? And they are there that rise up strife and contention. Therefore the law was slacked. The, judgment, the judges never, their true judgment never goes forth. The wicked compass the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. And here is his complaint, and here is his cry. How long, O Lord, shall I cry, and you don't hear me? Even when I cry out of violence, when I see this violence, and you do not hear me, you do not save. And the issue now is th this thing in the prophets. When he I see this in the Spirit. Lord, you show me these things, and they grieve me. These, these are the sins that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And you, you're showing me this, but when I, I cry for you to do something about it, I, you don't answer me. I cry, I grieve, you, you place the grievance on me, you put the burden on me. And folks, where is there a true heart? Where is there a true spiritual person who loves Jesus with all their heart, who is not grieved over the flaunting of sin in the face of God. Who, who, who is a Christian, who is a believer, would just say, well, it, what will be, will be, and we can't stop it. And many of us, we, we pray this prayer. If we don't pray it, we think it. We, we think this God, it looks, the same thing in Habakkuk, it looks like the wicked are winning. It looks like those who push their perversions upon us are prevailing. There's no other generation in history 
that ever propose what we see and hear being foisted upon us now by the courts and, and by those who want to foster their perverse natures and perverse uh, lifestyles upon the whole of society. That men should marry men and women marry women. And, and there's something innately in us, there's something in the heart that says, Oh God, how long? How long? How long does this go on? When do you stop it? We, we, will this next generation who thinks all of these things are not only right, but perhaps preferred? And, and will God stand by and just let it all happen? Is he just going to let it? Is, 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 is God going to let the rich rob the houses of the poor and five million people lose their homes because of fraud? Because of rich men, they're dancing according to one prophet on the thresholds of the poor? How long do we, we expect did we expect God to just... And, and this is the cry of the, the prophet. Lord, you know these things. They've piled up to heaven. And what do I do? Because I cry and I pray. and You're not hearing me. And folks, this, this problem of God seemingly not to answer our prayers is sweeping through the body of Christ. I hear it from so many young people from different states and from college students who have drifted away from God and those who have never had a heart for God. And you, you find almost every time you ask the questions, the right questions, you'll say, well, for me, my prayers don't work. God has never answered my prayer. You always find that at the back of it. And this is what is going through the mind of the prophet. And he says in verse 13, You're, You are much purer than to behold this evil. You can't just look on iniquity. Wherefore are you looking upon them that deal treacherously and hold your tongue while the wicked devour the man who is more righteous than himself? He said, God, you are pure eyes then to allow this to go on. Such an overwhelming burden, he said, I have to get away. And he isolated himself in a tower. <clears throat> I, I can't go into that. Somewhere he got alone with God. He said, I'm going to wait until God speaks to me. And then he says, God, speak to me first. I want you to deal with me. Now, he had some things that he had to face. It's, first of all, he had, he had to face this thing in him that, that says God is not answering. God is winking at sin. God's just allowing these things to go. And he's not doing anything about it. There's no evidence that God is judging sin. And so he gets away and God gives him a vision. But first of all, he says, I'm going to wait to see what the Lord says to me, how he rebukes me, or the very words, how is he going to rebuke me? He, he knew in his heart he had to have the right Holy Ghost view of how to face what was coming. It couldn't be his own zeal. God would not allow him when this Chaldean army said, God said they're going to go from from all through the land, from east to west, they're, they're going to devastate the whole nation. They're going to devastate it. That's what is coming. But he didn't go any further than that until he dealt with the attitude of this, this humble prophet. And his attitude, before he goes into the secret closet, and seeks the face of God, his attitude was, God, I'm just going to go in and, and wait. And what he expected to hear is, is all the details of what is coming, and he wanted to know all about that. But God says, no, I'm going to deal with you first. He had to deal with probably the Jonah syndrome, where, you know, the, the prophet... God said, you dare not do this. You dare not stand and say, I told you so. I warned you. And what that really says, look, I, I want to be confirmed as a prophet. I, I want to be acknowledged. 
Lord, you're, you're sending me for the people now. You're telling me there's calamity coming. And God has to deal with this man because he, he, goes, uh, he goes into it with this mindset. Behold, all you among the heathen, and listen, and wonder marvelously, because I'm going to do a work in your days which you will not believe, though he, he told you. All he saw was the devastation. But listen to the scripture. When I heard, God, God told him, he says, the Chaldeans are going to come, they're going to devour and march through the length and breadth of the land. When I heard this, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bone, I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh unto the people, he will invade them with truth. But he remembers now that he has been called as a prophet. And he knows that the body, those, those godly people are going to ask questions. All right, if, if God is going to raise up a rod of chastening against a nation that has pushed you out of their very society, if, if, if this is so, how we face it? You're getting a word of judgment. What's, what's the word? How, how does the church respond to this? What's going to happen? How do we get a hold of something from God? And he's seeing this. And folks, this... I have, I'm going to quote you a page at the conclusion of my message this morning. This is a page from a message I preached in 1992 from this pulpit called The Desolation of America. But I'm going to show you what hope I saw back then because the Lord told me I couldn't preach all these prophetic messages. I couldn't warn the people of the holo economic holocaust that was coming. I couldn't do it until I got a vision of God's true heart and for his people. And that when the questions are asked, what are we going to do? How do we face this? We still have to go to the Word. We have to go to the Word. And God deals preciously with this man's heart. Let me find his prayer here just a moment. I, O oh Lord, have heard your voice and your speech, and I was afraid, O oh Lord. He said, now you, you've given me this message of coming desolation. And I tremble. Folks, I tremble when I see in the book, I tremble at God's Power. I tremble at the way he works in righteous judgment. Tremble at his holiness. And, and there is a human fear. If, if, if there's anyone listening to me that's really close to the heart of God, and you tell me you don't have that first flush of fear when these things are suddenly and swiftly upon us, that's not so. We need to be honest about it and not be in denial. But now listen to what God is doing in this man's heart. He said... <clears throat> Oh, Lord, I've heard your speech and was afraid. And here's his prayer now. Oh, Lord, revive the work in the midst of these years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. He said, oh, God, now we have to understand, obtain mercy. And he begins to plead for mercy. That's what these prayer meetings are going to be about, I understand, the pleading with God's heart in wrath or in times of when the rod is being applied and there's chasing upon a people, a nation, and the nations of the world. Folks, he has a new vision now. He's, he's ready to go to the people with a message. He said in verse 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up in him is not right, not upright. What he's saying, the message I'm going to give is not for people who are proud. He said those that are proud and hard, they're not going to hear, they're not going to understand. They're not going to be able to hear. The, the Bible says the Lord is known by the judgments he executes. And that's in Psalm 916. 
And when the hand is lifted up, he's speaking of the wicked in Isaiah 26, 11. When the hand of God is lifted up, the wicked will not see it. They will not understand what's going on. They won't know who caused They won't know how it originated and how it happened so suddenly. They won't understand it. He said, God's people, they will know. They will know. They will understand. They'll know that this is God at work. And then he says, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, this is not just some kind of theological trick or something. No, just believe. Let's just, just believe. If I ask you this morning, how, how do you live by your faith? Faith is an action. It's something you do after you've received it as not a merit, but as a gift of God. It's something that you can train. It's something you can work on. It's something you can bring as a gift to Him. And it can grow and it can become a steadfast, gold-like faith. You can build up your faith, the Scripture says. But if I ask you this morning, I'm going to ask you, how do you live by your faith? What, how this, what, is the, what are the outworkings of this faith in your heart? Let me give you just a few things that I believe the Holy Spirit uh, has worked into my own life. And it's helped me so much uh, in what we see and hear coming because I, I've been a, a, a student of the Old Testament uh, and how God works in both grace, mercy, and chastenings. First of all, to live by one's faith is to see God's hand in His holiness in every judgment and every shaking. It is to understand. God said to the prophet, I am going to do a work. My hand is behind this. Now, folks, I have tried. In fact, I've, on my notes, I've scribbled out some things because I said, Lord, I don't want to say this because it's going to be so offensive to so many people. But if you're a Bible believer and you know your book and you know the Bible, you know that God judges sin. You know that there comes a time. He warned us. It'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, you understand that. When it comes, I, I'm going to judge. And there will be. There, there will be, and it's in mercy that God, the, these are redemptive judgments. There are some that don't appear to be redemptive judgments, but God was always purging, preserving, and, and how merciful, how long God waits, because the Bible says that God gets no delight in judgment. He gets no delight in the death of sinners. He gets no delight when He has to judge I've never gotten any delight whenever I've had to chastise my children. Thank God I don't have to do that with my grandchildren. And thank God my kids are grown enough and I don't have to do that except by my mouth. But folks, my soul cannot be at ease. And the deeper and the darker conditions get in any time, if we don't understand that the Heavenly Father is at work, that the Heavenly Father is doing what He promised to do in the Scripture, and when I know that my Father is at work, I, my soul can be at peace, my soul can be at rest, because my God, my, my God is doing what He warned He would do, what He said He would do. Who but a merciful, loving God could look on a whole society going money crazy? How but a merciful God could stand by while one man frauds 50 billion people and perhaps half of it going to charitable societies, bankrupting many and stripping them? How long... Would God stand by and not for the, for the sake of the poor and the widows and 
the thousands of Mexican in California that were taken into offices and they didn't have jobs and thousands and thousands of men who worked for these companies lying on their applications that they had jobs putting in false amounts telling them lies we're at already two and a half million of those those junk bonds those fraudulent thing. Folks, if that doesn't make you weep inside, I can't handle it. And I don't have those pure eyes of a holy God. How long does God stand by and let institutions and the rich wallowing in billions and one day in fact, in two weeks, in mid-October, just about three months ago, it all ended the day the Lehman Brothers down the street here went down. And within two weeks, three trillion dollars vanished on the earth. The monies that were supposed to be nest eggs all gone. The rich man's wealth, Proverbs 18.11, is his strong place or is his security. But folks, how, how is God going to wake up a whole world? How is God going to wake up? Will he just let this by and, and just appear as though he was asleep? Does, does he allow this to go on until, what, five million more lose their homes? How long does this go before God says it's enough? The sins have reached into heaven. And, and, and so, in two weeks, it was all over. It was all over. The entire credit system of the whole world froze. Who but God? Who but, we don't like to hear that. Because you see, we, 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 we are, we we're so, we preach as we should love. We preach love, but in many circles, in many churches now, we, we have ripped out most of the Old Testament, and we don't believe anymore. Now, I, I know that this is not you, where you are, but can't believe, can't accept that God is at work. But, but I, I can't have peace in my heart. I, I hate what I see coming. I weep inside and I grieve, and I know that we're all going all going through the same battle, same struggles, and the same things are facing all of us. But God, in His grace and His mercy, sent forth His Spirit because He's trying, according to this, to renew the face of the earth, to renew it. He can't do it until He deals with those things that were out of control, that would have destroyed And devastated. Secondly, if I am to walk and live by faith, I have got to stop worrying about the future of the Church of Jesus Christ. I have to have an assurance. My faith has to be lay hold of the truth that God said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. That is the living word of God. Now, I know what the Bible says in the last days. There's going to be perilous times. Men are going to have a form of godliness and deny the power. There'll be a falling away, the Bible says. Many will lose their faith. Love for Christ will grow cold and lukewarm. But at the same time, the Bible says, in the midst of all this, I am going to pour out my Holy Spirit. And He's doing that. There's a reservoir. The Holy Spirit has never been used up. The Holy Spirit never drains Himself out. There, he, he is got the power and the authority. He can do it at any time, and He can do it in the midst of hard times. He can do it and does do it in the midst of, of 
calamities. And when that happens, people come flocking to God's word and to his house. There's a scripture in Zechariah. It says, it, ten men out of all nations shall take hold of the skirt of him that's a Jew or, or one who knows God. And they shall say, we will go with you, for we heard that God's with you. We have come to that time, folks. We are there. We are there. The world is going to see something in the church of Jesus Christ. By the way, he's purging out all the dross. Every, every minister of the gospel who f focused on wealth and prosperity, how, how does God stop it? No denomination can stop it. How will you stop it? God says, I'll just shut the bank accounts. I'll just shut it down. Shut it down. This is already happening. I don't gloat over that. I grieve over that. And I pray for every, everyone who's misled the church of Jesus Christ. I pray for their soul. And I pray the opening of their eyes. But now with cliches, uh, a false hope and cliches that everything is just going to be rosy dozy. That's not going to work anymore. That doesn't work anymore. The times are too serious. But there's this word from the Lord, and I want to give this to you, folks. And <clears throat> it's in Malachi. You don't have to turn there. It's in the third chapter, verses 15 and 16. They that feared the Lord. Now, folks, we are at this time. Now, get it, please. If my faith is going to grow, if, my, if I'm going to live, I have a faith that I'm going to live by. This is how I'm going to face. This is going to be my model. This is how I'm going to not only survive, but I'm going to overcome. I have got to say that the same God that is faithful to his woes, faithful to his warnings, faithful to his... Uh, judgments is the same God who's going to be faithful to me. The, folks, I, I have to include something here that I think is, is very important. If I can just find it. Folks, will you bear with me? I'm, I'm not trying to preach a sermon. And I don't care, I, you probably won't shout. And I'll tell you, if you're not shouting by the end, when I show you what, where we're going, <clears throat> then I, I'll leave that to the Lord. <laughs> yeah, let's just stick with, <clears throat> we'll go to... Uh, the third, this, is, this is still in Habakkuk. I found it now. Verses 15. And go to, if you have your Bible open, go to 3. Verse 15. Let's start uh, verse 17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be on the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, there shall be no herd in the stall. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk over my high places. God's, the prophet, after all of this, he's saying, here's what could happen. But he said, if so, I'm going to rejoice in my soul because I know that I'm not just living for today. I know that I have an eternal purpose. And folks, we, we have got generation after generation, 2,000 years of generations, and those who trusted God in difficult times, martyrs who have died for Christ, those who were sawn asunder, and all of those in Hebrews 11, and a whole host of witnesses in heaven right now who went through fires and floods and depressions and recessions and you name it. They've been in there, seen it all, done it all, and have been rescued from it all. 
and they would be that, those host of witnesses that say to you and now, the church of Jesus Christ shall prevail. This will not bring down the house of God. Times Square Church will be here. It's not the building, but it'll be here. No, I believe until Jesus comes in one form or another. God will never let the seed die. He will water it, and if He's watering it by the Holy Ghost, there's going to be fruit. There are going to be those ten men taking a hold of one Christian's skirt or his faith and saying, I want to go with you because I see God in you. I see faith in you. I see God holding you and keeping you when everybody around you is in fear and panic. I see something in you, and I want what you have. I want what you have. Would to God they could see that when you walk out, when you get on the subway or bus, and everyone you shake hands with, and everyone that you deal with in a retail shop, wherever you're at, they could see a countenance, not some pasted smile, not something put on, but something comes from that deep quietness in your soul where you can back away and you don't have to have all the details. You say, God, your hand is at work. You are at work and you're God. And if, you're, if you, God says, he told to Job, he said, I, I made the snow. I made the ice. I put the wings on the fowl. I divided the darkness from light. I've created every being there is. And, and he said, I, I have found out, I have found every proud man and brought him down. I brought him down to lowness. Now listen to what he, what he says. God, God says, and this is what he told Job. He said, look, if you want to understand my heart, I'm telling you, you've got to look at my majesty and my power. And folks, we are seeing a demonstration of, of God's saving power, purging power, like the world has never seen. And I can say, I stand here now, you, you can, if this doesn't witness with your spirit, you, you, do, you go to God and let him uh, settle it. But as for me, I don't care, I guess I do care, but... No matter what the message is tomorrow, in the next month, in the next year, as time proceeds, I'm settled on this. God is at work. And if, 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 God, if, if God said he has located every proud man on earth and brought him low, then surely... He found me. He knows where I'm at. And as I said, he has my name. And if he can bring all the proud down and abase them, will he not take care of his children? He knows everything, where we are, every condition we face. Let me tell you something about the church of Jesus Christ. Malachi 3.16 they that fear the Lord. And this was spoken. I'm going to try to wrap this up in the next five minutes. This was spoken in times such as we're living in now. And this was spoken to Malachi the prophet. They that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those that feared the Lord and those who thought upon his name. God says, <clears throat> they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And I believe this is where the church is going. There's, there's going to be a spiritual camaraderie, so to speak. There, there's going to be a, just a knowing, an all-knowing of, of the precious remnant. Those who've anchored in faith those who are going to believe and trust God, you're going to know, you're going to recognize, there's going to be a something, there's something of, of spiritual fellowship that is coming. He said they're going to speak often one another, and they're going, these are encouragers, these are those speaking faith into the hearts and the lives of the body of Jesus Christ, and those willing to share their hurts, willing to share with others their needs. 
and, and not being afraid to, to call somebody when you're in need. Because the Bible says those that feared him, those that knew he was at work, they're going to speak often to one another. And God says, these fear my name. These know what I'm doing. These are not ignorant of my ways. God said, I will do nothing till I reveal it to my servants, the prophets. And that word means also watchmen. And there are many watchmen. God says, I'm not going to act until I'm going to give a hint. I'm going to, I'm going to let you know what I'm about to do. And he says, those that fear the name of the Lord. And this is where the church is going. It's not going to be helter-skelter. They're not going to be off isolated someplace. They're going to be joined one together. The true saints of God are going to be one in Christ. There is a tremendous unity. And the Lord said, I'm going to have a book of remembrance. This is not the book of life. This is the book of jewels. He said, I'm going to write those. Every one. God's going to keep a record of every one. Let me read it to you. And they will be to me as a possession, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. I should at least get an amen somewhere. <laughs> this is a book of remembrance. God is going to, this is, a, this is a special thing in the heart of God. And I know at my age, after 56 years, 57 years of preaching, I know, I know that I have never in my lifetime seen such a hand of God at work. And I've never had more hope for the church of Jesus Christ and I, I, I see this in the Spirit, and I, I see that God said, I'm going to spare them. I, I'm, I, I'm going to take special note of those who speak often one to another. And I will hear it, and I'll write a book of remembrance that those who wait on Him and those who fear the Lord. Thank God the church of Jesus Christ is not going down. We're going up. We are going up. Very, very quickly, if, if I'm going to live by my faith, I'm going to prepare an ark. Noah, moved by faith, build him an ark. Folks, there's no other place to turn. If you're looking to politicians, if you're looking to the government, they're talking about a trillion dollars of do this and do that. Folks, there's only one safe place. Everybody's looking for a safe place. I get so many letters. Where do I put my money? Where do I invest? What is it? I said, I don't know. I've invested in one thing. I know that the only answer is Jesus Christ the rock. There is no honest, godly preacher on the face of the earth that can back up in the Word of God anything that would hint to you and to me that we're not going to suffer in hard times. It's going to rain on the just and on the unjust. There's no preacher that can come to you and say that you will never lose your job. You'll never lose your house. You will never lose anything. But you are a special people. You will not suffer. You're going to be free of all this. No, 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 no. Because there's a whole 2,000 years of martyrs. And all the disciples, according to tradition, died as martyrs, those who gave the very faith that we believe today. And the Bible said they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods. They lost everything. And I, I have people write to me. One lady said, you wouldn't believe the shack I'm living in now, but, but she says, I'm trusting God. And God has been faithful. He will be faithful. He, he's going to be, but the only hope is to be so anchored in Jesus Christ I pray, that every, I pray that all the intelligent minds in, in the government 
I pray for the months ahead that God will give wisdom, that, that there will be hope, that there will be deliverance. But folks, don't put your trust in anyone but Jesus Christ. Put no more trust in man. Man doesn't have the answer. The last administration spent $350, billion, $350 billion to juice up the economy, and it didn't work. They had the answers then, they thought, and it didn't work. Folks, uh, we are not going to make it if we aren't so anchored that I am a son of the living God. Jesus Christ lives in me, and I'm going to live on this. This is how I'm going to walk by my faith. I'm going to put my trust in in Jesus Christ, because He alone can deliver. I want to just read. I looked at my archive this past week, and I just pulled this out, out of a, a whole box. This message was preached uh, Sunday a.m., March 23rd, 1992, about 18 years ago. And I'm reading word for word from my notes. This is what I preach from this pulpit. The subject was the coming desolation of America. And here's how I ended it. Here is what the Spirit is saying to the righteous. We need not fear when the desolation comes. Do not be afraid, the Scripture says, of sudden fear. Neither of the des desolation of the wicked. When it comes, for the Lord shall be your confidence. He will keep your foot from being taken. Dear saints, this is your antidote for fear. The Bible said men's hearts are going to fail them as they see all the desolations falling on the earth. And indeed, there will be incredible fear all around the earth. But beloved, learn this well. The same power that God uses to chasten is going to, and, and the wicked will preserve the righteous. We are going to see the warnings of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 being fulfilled to the letter before our eyes. Much, you, you'll be able to say, say to your soul, in spite of all of these, if God fulfills His promises of judgment so faithfully, how much more I can trust Him to be faithful to preserve me by His promises. With every piece of bad news crisis, God's people must look up and rejoice. The power behind it all is my God at work. He's keeping His Word. He will keep my, His Word to me. The time has come. Christ alone will be the only security and hiding place. Jesus Himself is going to gather up His body of believers. He's going to embrace them and pull them into His, home habita his own heart and habitation. And He's telling His people, I'm going to hide you from the storm when it rages. And a man shall be a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the storm. Christ the Lord is the only hiding place. You don't need anything else. You don't need a nest egg. You don't have to have an underground shelter because in Jesus you're as safe as you're ever going to get. Amen. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. You will compass me about with songs of deliverance. And then stand up while I read this last. Will you stand? For in the time of trouble... He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. And he shall establish me upon the rock. There's no fear, need to fear, no need to be distressed. Because when desolation falls, you are going to be hidden in the arms of Jesus. Eighteen years ago. Raise your hands. And say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. For a promise, you will hide me in your habitation, in your arms, safe in the storm. Thank Him. Thank Him. Fear not, for I am with you. My rod and my staff that comfort me. Folks, I had to go the long route to get to these words of comfort. But God has given this church over the years a 
spirit of faith. A spirit of faith to be a testimony to this city. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for the trust and the confidence that we can place in you and have a faith that will take us through the fire and every storm. Hallelujah. Folks, look at me, please. This has probably been one of the hardest uh, messages for me to ever preach. But if it were my last, I know that when I stand before God, I did what God told me to do. And nobody's blood will be on my hands. I stand before a holy God. Somebody sent my World Challenge ministry a very large check. And I called him up. He's a friend. <clears throat> I said, in so many words, thanks for the burden you put on me. I said, how to spend the money is off your hands now. It's on mine. And I was, ju I was just kind of joking with him. I said, now pray for me. Because I have to stand before God. And I answer for every penny. These are godly men. This is Teresa, the only one. Godly board. And in this church, we've always told the truth. And sometimes, Pastor Carter knows it, and the others who I was talking to Pastor Carter about the other day, you go home and you're wrenched inside and say, oh God, I would like to have people just shout and be blessed. But then you're going to go outside the door and you're going to turn on the news and you're going to hear something and say, Jesus said, I told you things beforehand so that when they happen, you will know that I spoke. I'm not trying to uh, play on your emotions. God forbid. Those are things we, we would judge for. But God had a reason, pastors. He had a reason for establishing this church in this city at this time. It wasn't a happenstance. This was a work of God to put it on Broadway into one of the most spectacular theaters in America. Now, I've never seen people in the last five years, especially that come to this church, look up and admire the building. But they've always honored the word that came forth. Pastor Carter, did I scare this congregation? <laughs> Do you have a witness to scare? <laughs> yes? Not for me. I don't want to leave this pulpit thinking I brought your spirit down. There has to be a quietness. There's a strength in quietness. I have a peace in me that I want you to know. Lord, I, we open this message praying Give us ears to hear what the Spirit says. Now, Lord, we're to rejoice in you. He said, when you see all these things beginning to happen, look up, rejoice, because you're going home. Your redemption is near. This is a sign of redemption at the door. Redemption 
is at the door. I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn this over to Pastor Carter. You know, the words that Pastor David spoke today were spoken as a spiritual father of this congregation. He is the man that God gave the burden to, to establish this church as a testimony in this city of the days that were coming, but not only the days that were coming, but the capability and power of God to keep a people. Now, it doesn't mean we won't go through hardship. You know that. We've spoken that very clearly. But in the midst of it all, to have that assurance in the heart that nothing has come my way that God hasn't allowed for a reason. Folks, I have found personally that to be a mainstay in my heart as a Christian. I have experienced some things that I've not liked. I've gone to some places that have not been pleasant. But the knowledge that everything is working together for good. I do love God and I'm called as you are according to his purpose. And everywhere we have to go. Folks, without this calamity that we are facing today as a people, as a nation, as a city. Without this calamity, think of how many would never consider Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They'd never think about eternity, about heaven. Think about this plane that came down in the river this week. If, if, if that had not happened and if people had been not on that particular vehicle, they would not have joined in the prayer meeting that started. But it was the calamity that turned to good. And we pray that they have the sense to realize that their lives have been spared divinely for a specific reason. Now, in the midst of all that's coming our way in the coming days, the Lord has sent you and I as a testimony to this city of the, key, of the fact that God knows everything that is happening and the Lord is well able to keep those who place their confidence in him. And you and I have to have that firmness in our step. We have to have that deep abiding trust in God because everything that we know might be taken away, and it is being taken away gradually, but it might in a moment of time get a whole lot worse than it is today. But you and I have to have that trust. I'm on this earth to glorify Jesus Christ. That is number one in your life and in my life. And if we will open our hearts and say, God, in my trial and in my situation, Jesus Christ, Son of God, be glorified in me. Be glorified in me just through the fact that my conversation is not the same as those who are without hope. My trust is not placed in anything that I read in the newspaper or see on the news. None of these things are governing my life. None of these things are forming the testimony of my lips. But I have the presence of God in me. I have the Christ who created the universe living inside an earthen vessel. Somewhere along the line, the reality of that has got to take hold in us. We don't have just a figure of God or just a, an idea about God. We have the God who created the universe. The very God who created the universe has bound his life with yours and with mine. And he's promised that he will glorify his name. Whether that, however that happens, he's promised. I know that some went into the arena in the days of Rome. And even though their end seemed to be uh, a difficult one, his name was glorified. You hear testimonies of people who stood up in their seats when they saw such courage in the face of such overwhelming adversity. And they professed that whatever it is that they believe, that is God. Praise be to God. That may be the testimony that some of us have in the coming days. Blessed be the Lord. I'd like, Greg, thank you for singing that song. I'd like to sing that again if we can. And those that are going through the trial of your life and you don't see any way out, I want to tell you, as you heard today, Jesus Christ is the way out. The promises of God are the way out. There might not be a physical way out of what you have been called to endure, but there is a spiritual way out. It's a heart of trust and confidence in God. And you can give no greater offering to the Lord today, but that you bring this situation, you bring your whole future to the altar and lay it on the altar and say, Lord, if I have only another year to live on this earth, let it be one where your name is glorified through me. Let it be one where there's a song of praise in my heart. <laughs> praise be to God. Let's sing it again. And would you have the courage? In the annex, you can stand between the screens, main sanctuary. You can slip out of your seat in the balcony. And bring your situation to God, whatever it is, whatever impossibility you are facing, whatever fears the enemy is trying to put in front of you. Bring these things to God and say, Lord, I trust you. I trust that you will not fail me. In the midst of everything that's going on in the nation, Lord, I'm asking you, to be glorified in my life. Would you do that right now? Wherever you are, just slip out of wherever you are and join us at this altar. And we're going to pray a prayer of thanksgiving to God. He will not fail his people. 
He will not fail his church. The gates of hell will never prevail against you. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. You can start rejoicing even on your way down now. You can start thanking him. Even as you come down, you can say, Lord, thank you, God. You will not fail me. You will not forsake me. <clears throat> no weapon that's formed against me is going to prosper. Your life is inside of me. And you're going to carry me through. Even if, even if it looks like I'm overcome in the world, I'm not overcome in the spirit. Because God, to leave this earth is to be in the presence of Almighty God. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Give him praise even as you come down these aisles. Give him thanks for his goodness. Praise be to God. Two things I'd like us to do today as a congregation, those that are at the altar and in the main sanctuary in the annex. Would you thank Pastor David for being a man of God that has the courage to speak what God... We love you, Brother Dave. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. And you pray for every pastor that touches this pulpit, not only today but in the days to come, that we have the courage to do the same. Speak every word to you that God is speaking, holding nothing back. And secondly, now I'd like you to thank God because he's going to keep you. Now keep in mind, he told his disciples, not one hair of your head would perish, but they all died as martyrs. You haven't got to go home and think about that one. But he was speaking about something eternal. He said, I've begun, I've begun an eternal work in you. And even though physically you might have to go through some very difficult things, this work does not stop with the demise of your body. This is an eternal work. That's where trust really comes into the heart. When I begin to realize that in Christ, I'm created for God for eternity. Father, we give you praise this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, with everything that is in us, in spite of what we're going to face in the coming days. Lord, you will have a testimony and a song, Lord, that cannot be taken away by time nor circumstance. We thank you, God, that we can bring to you our circumstances, the trials and difficulties that we're facing. We can put them safe and square into your hands. Because, Jesus, you said that out of the Father's hand no man can take us out. No one, no situation, nothing can take us out of the security that is ours in God through Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, Father, we ask you for Christ's sake that you would pour out the Holy Spirit on this church on this city, on this earth, in unprecedented measure. We need the Holy Spirit. We need you, Holy Spirit, to get through the coming days. We can't do it with any amount of goodwill. We can't do it with any amount of self-effort. It has to be a supernatural empowerment of God to get through these days. We cry out to you, Father. Lord, this is how Jesus will be glorified in us. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Give us strength, O oh God. Touch every honest heart. Give us, God, the strength that we need to glorify you in the coming days. Turn us from iniquity. Convict us and convince us of sin. God, where we're embracing something we shouldn't, turn us from it, O oh Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord. This church, this church will be here as a bright and shining star in the midst of Broadway until the day you come and take us home unto yourself. We thank you, Lord, that nothing shall prosper against it, O oh God. We give you praise and glory for this. We thank you, Lord, for a song of praise that will be sung in this house, a song of glory, a song of trust, a song of Jesus Christ, God. We thank you. We praise you. We praise you, God, with everything that is in us. We give you praise and glory, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, both now and forever. Amen and amen. Give God a shout of praise in this house. Give him glory for who he is and what he will do. Hallelujah, Lamb of God. We thank you, Lamb of God. We praise you, Lamb of God, with everything that's in our hearts. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Praise God.